Hey everyone, it's Jeremy Siner, and today we're going to tackle making a chair procedurally with the new model graph in Substance 3D Designer. We'll be able to change the height of the legs and back, the thickness of the leg and the seat, and also change the overall size while having everything stay in place. Now, I've aimed this video towards people who are just getting started into procedural modeling, so don't worry if you don't have any experience doing something like this. We're going to cover a couple of important and extremely useful concepts today, like how to stack and place objects relative to each other, no matter how tall or wide they are, using exposed parameters or variables. Before we jump into making the graph, I want to take a few minutes to talk about procedural modeling. Now, you can totally skip this chapter uh, with the chapter button next to the video controls, or click the time code in the description if you'd like. First off, because we're just getting into procedural modeling, I want to ask the big question. Why make this procedurally? What's the point of making geometry procedurally? Well, it's exactly why we make textures procedurally. Iteration. When we create a system that produces our desired result, we can create an infinite amount of variations of our model, which will speed up our workflow and increase productivity. The cost is the effort up front. It might take more effort to either learn how to make things procedurally or to create the system first. But then after that, you can tweak a few of the settings and those settings are the ones that you create and then you can get exactly the geometry or the texture that you want. Now, once you spend your time making the tool, you make your life easier when you need to use it. In our case, we're making a chair. Now, odds are at some point you're going to need to put a chair in your scene. Now, instead of modeling by hand and making it custom tailored to the scene and making it from scratch, you can change the size, height, and back with just a couple of sliders and boom, you have a perfectly good chair. Now granted, we're making a very simple chair today, but the concept applies to anything you want to make. Another important question before we start, and I, I promise this will be quick. Does it make sense to build this procedurally? Now this one's pretty easy to answer. Are you gonna need another one of these again? Maybe a few? If yes, then the answer is probably yes, it does make sense to make this procedurally. Can you build this quicker if you modeled it by hand? Well, maybe you're an extremely fast modeler, or maybe the model you're making isn't that difficult to make if you already have the modeling chops. Mad props to all of you hard surface modelers out there. What you do blows my mind. <laughs> Now, speed is the name of the game in production. So if you're only making one or two of these, maybe modeling your asset by hand is better. It's definitely easier to make more intricate, unique details when modeling by hand, especially if you're sculpting some details using ZBrush. There is, of course, the option to do both. You could procedurally generate a base mesh first and then take that model into ZBrush to add your fine and unique details. It's good to ask these questions. Procedural modeling is a great tool, but like most tools, it only works best when used for the purpose it was designed for. The easier these 3D programs get to create models procedurally, I can see how the balance might shift a little towards people going more procedural over hand modeling. With all that in mind, let's start making a chair using the new model graph in Substance 3D Designer. So here's an example of what our final graph could look like. Now, I know it looks a little bit crazy with all of the connection lines, but once we piece through it, it's going to make a lot more sense. So here I have the 3D view. I've also added a small little ground plane. Uh, by the end of our video, we'll probably have something like this. So I'm gonna double click on my graph and we can take a look at some of the parameters that we're going to create today. So one of them is the seat size, so I can increase this parameter to increase the size of the overall chair. I can also adjust the height of the base or the seat of the chair, change the leg thickness and leg height, as well as the back height. So let's go ahead and create a new model graph. So to do that, go to File, New Package, and I can say Substance Model Graph, or I can click this icon here, which says Add a New Substance Model Graph. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. 
So instead of coming up with some properties and templates, it's just gonna bring a new package in here and new substance model graph. So I'm gonna right click on our model graph and hit rename. You can also hit F2 and I'm gonna call this chair tutorial and hit enter and then give this a save. Okay, so let's set up our 3D view here. First thing I wanna do is I wanna go into our display and I wanna make sure that I have grid enabled. So that's really important so that we can see where the base of our pivot of our objects are and just so we can see where everything is in relative 3D space, it's really useful. I also wanna to go to display and enable the axis or axes. So we'll get something like what we have in the corner here and by default, you might have a rounded cube or some sort of primitive in here, but you'll be able to see our axis here at the bottom a little bit and when we start editing our geometry. So we have our grid and our axis enabled. So let's start making some nodes. Our chair is going to be made out of cubes. Substance 3D Designer has a node that lets you make simple 3D shapes called primitives with its primitive 3D node. So I'm gonna click on my graph, hit spacebar, and type in primitive, and you can see we have primitive 3D. I'm gonna hit enter. And so if I double click on this primitive 3D, you see we have a cube. Now it's looking like it's removed our grid. So I'm gonna to go to display and just try and bring back the grid and the axis here. So we've got a lot of great properties and parameters that we can edit from this primitive 3D. So we can choose from a cube or a cone cylinder. We've got a lot of great primitives that we can use. We're going to use cube for now. And so we can adjust the width and the height and the depth. I'm going to bring down the size of my cube. Right now it's really big at 100, 100, and 100. So I'm going to bring this down to something more chair size. Maybe we'll go with something like 12 for the height, width, and depth. And if you ever get lost in the 3D view, you can hit F and it's just gonna focus us in on that object. Great, so next what I wanna change is this bevel radius parameter. And so if I increase that, you can see we get these really nice rounded edges of our cube. And so because nothing in the real world has a completely sharp edge, we can add this bevel radius and get a more realistic approach. Something like 0 0.09, I think is looking good for this example. And we can increase the number of segments on the bevel. So if I, for instance, take this up and increase the segments, it's gonna smooth out and add more geometry to our bevel and make it an overall smooth subdivided change. So what I'll do is I'll keep the number of segments on all bevels to two and then bring down that bevel radius back to 0 0.09, I think is where I had it. So that's looking good. Now we want to move the cube upwards so that the bottom is always resting on the ground. Right now, you can see by default, the cube center is right in the middle. So to make this happen, we can determine what the height of the cube is, then divide it in half. We can then take that value and tell a transform node how far to move the cube up in the y direction. So I'm gonna click on my graph, hit spacebar, and bring in a transform node. This is a lot like a transform or transformation 2D when we make textures in Substance Designer. So I'm gonna connect the output of my primitive 3D to the source of our transform node. Double click on that, and because we haven't moved anything, it's not gonna make a change, but now that I'm double clicking and viewing our transform node, and I change the translation properties, we can now move this cube in any direction that we want. For instance, I can move this up 50. You can see it's moved it actually quite high above our ground plane, and we can readjust it accordingly. Now, to procedurally tell the transform node how high to move the cube, we have to expose the translation property as an input pin. And once we do that, 
we then need to feed in the x, y, and z values in the format of a vector3 value. So to expose this translation property, which is three values, I'm going to click this icon here. Kind of looks like an eye. It says create an input pin for this parameter. So I'm going to click that. And you can see we now have this blue square translation pin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a vector three. And you can see that this vector three node has an output that matches the same color as this input. So if I connect that, I can now double click this vector three to edit its properties. And I can continue to adjust and make changes to the translation property of this transform node. So what I want to do instead now, if I delete this vector three, is I want to create a float to vector three node. So this takes these green inputs of single value floats and combines them into a vector float three, which is what we need again for our transform node. So this float to vector three takes three separate singular values and then combines them into that float three value. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to single click on our primitive 3D. That's our cube that we have right now. And I want to expose the height parameter. But instead of exposing it by using that eyeball, I'm going to expose it by using this one, which has a plus inside the box. So I'm going to click that, and it does two things. It exposes that value as an input pin, but also creates a float node and then connects the two automatically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this float that we just exposed and I'm going to plug it into the second input of our float to vector three. That's going to control this value two parameter and you can read this like X, Y, and Z. So now I'm just going to connect our float to vector three into our translation input that we created for the transform. And then making sure that I double click on this transform to see the result in the 3D view, I'm going to single click on the float and change the values. So you can see now that we're changing both the height and how far the transform is translating this in the y direction. But it's not quite doing what we want. That's because we still need to divide our seat height variable in half. And so to remember what this value represents, this variable, I'm going to right click and choose add comment. And I'm going to call this seat height. And we're going to comment or name our variables as we go so that you remember which one is which. To perform mathematical operations in a model graph, we need to use the binary operation or unary operation nodes. In this case, we want binary because we're performing a mathematical task with two values. So I'm going to click on my graph, hit spacebar, and type in binary. And you can see we want binary operation on float because we're doing the operation on the float value type. So I'm going to hit Enter. Here's our binary operation on float. And now in the parameters, I want to make sure that my operation is set to division. You can see we have value one and value two accordingly, and they've already been exposed as input pins here. So I'm going to take our seat height float, and I'm going to plug it into the first pin or the value one input of our binary operation on float. And then I'm going to click on my binary operation on float and then change the value manually here to two. So this is read as seat height is being divided by the second value here, which is two. Now, if I plug this into our float to vector three in our Y value here, you can see that our box is now resting flat on our ground plane. So if I go to our float value and change the value, no matter what it is, the cube is still resting flat on the ground plane. Now we're going to be doing this a lot in this tutorial, and it's a good way to position objects in relation not only to just the ground plane, but also to each other. For now, I'm just going to bring this value down a little bit, because this basically is our seat, and I want my seat to be a bit thin, at least for now. So to keep organized, what I'm going to do is, like I do in most of my tutorials, I'm going to divide these parts into components and just frame them up. So I'm going to select all these nodes hit spacebar and type frame. And then I'll change the title to seat. Let's apply the same technique to making the legs. But instead of making each of the four legs individually, let's use an array duplication node. 
So like before, I'm going to start off with another primitive 3D. So spacebar, start typing in primitive and get our primitive 3D. Let's double click that to load this up in our graph view. Now you see it's disappeared. That's because we were zoomed into such a small scale before. And by default, these primitives come in at a pretty large size, which is 100, 100, 100. So if I zoom out or hit F to focus in, we can see it again. So I'm going to bring down the width, height, and depth again to something relatively small. Let's go with 1 by oh, 3 by 1. And then I'll hit F to zoom in again. So I'm going to get that bevel radius again, and I'm probably going to keep the same radius that I had before. So I'll type that in. I can double click the parameter and hit 0 0.09 to get the same. And then the number of segments on all bevels, I'm going to bring back to two. So we get the same thing as before. I'm going to think ahead a little bit here. I know that eventually I'm going to want to put these cubes on the ground plane, just like I did the seat, so that when I move those legs in the future, the bottom or pivot will be located at the bottom of the leg instead of in the middle where it is currently. So to do that, I'm going to need to expose the height as a float variable, just like we did before, so that I can reference it later on. So in our primitive 3D for our leg, let's go to our height, and I'm going to expose with the plus button, not the eyeball, so that I can get a float variable here, and it's connected up into the height, which is a new input pin now in our primitive 3D for our leg. So like before, I'm going to right-click on our float, add a comment so I can name this. And this doesn't actually name the node itself. This is just so that we can keep organized in our graph. So I'll call this leg height. And now let's perform the same operation that we did before and divide this by two using a binary operation on float. So I'll bring in a binary operation on float. I'm going to connect this leg height to the value one and then manually change the value 2 here to 2. And I got to make sure that my operation is division. So now to move that cube, I need my transform node. So spacebar transform. So the thing that we want to transform is our primitive 3D for our leg. I'm just going to put that into the source input for the transform. And now I want to expose the translation parameter like we did before as an input pin. So I'm going to click on that eyeball expose button and we get our translation float three input here. Now, here's something that's cool. You can see that our binary operation on float is getting this green output, which is a singular float value. But we need to make sure that we get a float three input to our transform because we have three values. If I connect the singular float output into this input, Substance 3D Designer is smart and automatically converts this for me. So it gets a float to vector3 node, but connects all of our singular float values into each of our inputs, the x, y, and z. So what I can do now is delete the x, which is the first one, and the z, which is the last one here. And now, if I double click on the transform, you can see that our leg is resting on the ground plane. And that also means that its pivot, or axis, is going to be at the bottom here. So just make sure that you disconnect those connections, otherwise you're going to get our leg out of place. And so you can see where this axis is, is where the pivot of this piece of geometry is. So we want it right dead in the center. So I'm going to delete that connection to our float to vector 3 to make sure it's right in the center and resting on the ground plane. So now I mentioned earlier that we're going to use an array duplication node so that we don't need to continue to make copies of all of these nodes to create all of our legs. So what I'll do is hit spacebar and bring in the array duplication node. And so this node is expecting the assets or the inputting geometry as our first input. So I'll take the transform output and put that into the input of our array and double clicking that you see nothing happens, but that's because all of our duplications are happening in the same place in the center. So what I could do is adjust the offset on the X and on the Y and on the Z. And you can see that we have some duplications of our object. You'll also notice that our legs have their axis on the bottom 
and they're staying on the ground plane, at least the ones that haven't been offset on the Y. So I'm going to set our duplications here. And the duplications is just how many times in what direction our array duplication node will continue to duplicate, which is really cool. So I'm going to keep it to two on the X, one on the Y, and then we have our two on the Z. Next up, what I want to do is find this center parameter and change it from false to true. You can see what that does. Instead of duplicating in the direction, it's going to keep our array object in the center of our pivot, which is really helpful here. So what I'd like to do is no matter how big the seat is, if we just bring that back into our viewport, I'd always like the legs to be placed in the corners, no matter how big the legs are themselves, or no matter how big the seat is in terms of width and depth. So this is going to require to get us some more information from our graph and also do a simple math calculation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some room in our seat because we need to get the seat width and depth information. So if I go to that primitive 3D, which is our seat, and I expose the width and the depth as floats. And what I'll do now is I'll make a new float variable node here, just float if you type it in. And I'm going to connect it to both the width and the depth. And let's give it a value other than zero. I'll do something like 12. And so I connected this float to both the width and the depth because I want this chair to be square no matter what. And that's going to help us with our simple math that we want to do. So I'm going to comment this new float and I'm going to call it seat size. So that's pretty cool that we can control the seat size with just one value. But better yet, we can use this variable to do some math and determine how far we can offset our legs to keep them in the corners. We just need one more piece of information. I'm going to go back to our legs here. And I want to expose the primitive 3D for our legs. I want to expose the width and depth of this to get our leg thickness. So one way I can quickly do this is I can expose the width with the plus button, and that'll give me a float that I can work with. Let's drag some of these things down. And then I can find the depth and just expose it with the eyeball. So now we have the depth here. And I already have my width connected, but now I can just connect the float to my depth just removes the amount of clicks that you need to make. So I exposed one parameter with the float that was automatically created, and then just exposed the other pin so I could connect that to that pin. So I'm going to right click, add a comment, and call this leg thickness. So now just like our seat, if I change this float, let's make it something large like five, and then I can change this value and adjust the thickness of our leg geometry. I'm going to keep it at one for now. So here's where the small math calculation comes in. If we subtract the leg thickness from the seat size, we'll get the value that we need for our array duplication nodes offset in the X and Y parameters. Now, don't ask me how that works mathematically. I just tried it one time. It does the job. The parameters that we're going to be adjusting in our array duplication are the offset in the X and the Z. Did I just say Z? Wow, I'm spending a lot of time in the UK lately. We're going to control the offset in the X and the Z with the output of another math calculation. So let's expose those offset parameters first. So I'm gonna take the offset X parameter from our array duplication and use the eyeball to expose it as an input pin. And I'm gonna do the same thing for the offset Z and hit the eyeball. So there's our two input pins. Now let's do that math that I mentioned before. So what I need is that binary operation on float. So I'll bring in a binary operation on float node. I'm going to make sure that the operation is set to subtraction. So if I get the seat size, plug that float into the first value, and then I'm subtracting the leg thickness. So I'll put that into the second value. And now if I take this floats output and put it into the offset X and offset Z, you can see they've now moved out. 
And so if I just look at the transform here and then look at the array duplication, you can see they're matching up. But if I switch between these two pieces of geometry, notice that the seat is on the bottom and our legs are on the bottom. So if we combine them together, we'd end up with intersecting geometry here. What we have to do now is stack the seat on top of the legs using the same method that we've been doing throughout the tutorial so far. But because our seat and legs have their pivots on the ground already, all we have to do is add. So back in my seat component, I'm going to extend it just a little bit more and I'm going to add another transform node. So spacebar transform. So the source is going to be the previous transform node that we had when we brought the seat to the ground plane. Great, so I'm going to double click this transform. And so now we need to raise our geometry up. So that means a translation on the Y. To control this translation procedurally, let's expose it with the eyeball as a pin. And I'm going to manually create a float to vector three conversion node here. And I'm just going to connect that into our translation input that we just made. So now we don't need to do any extra math here. All we need to do is get the height of our legs. Luckily, we've made a variable for that with our float node here called leg height. So let's plug the leg height into the Y input of our float to vector three for our translation. And you can see it popped up there. Now, if I quickly switch between the two, you'll see that the seat is resting on our legs. Now, this is a bit tiresome, so to see both pieces of our geometry at the same time, let's create a merge node. So, spacebar, merge. We've got a bunch of inputs here that we can combine different sources of geometry. So I'll take our seat and put it in the first input, and then the array as the second input, double click on the merge, and now we have a table. So now I could call this a day and you could create a procedural table in Substance Designer, but let's turn this into a chair. Right now I am noticing that the legs are a bit short. So let's go to our leg height and increase the value here. And somewhere around eight, I think I found was pretty good. Looking great. One last thing I like to do to keep organized, of course, is to frame up our component here. So I'm going to select all the nodes that we use to make the leg spacebar frame, drag this down here a little bit and call this legs. So this is pretty cool. If I go to my seat size and change the value, the legs are going to stay in place. I can also change the seat height and we can change that. But now let's add it back to our chair. So we just have one more component to make. So like before, to start the back, I'm going to make a new primitive 3D, spacebar, primitive 3D. And again, if I double click this, you can see it's massive. So I'll just adjust these width, depth, and height parameters to one for now to keep us all on a similar scale. Hit F there to focus in. And let's bring that bevel in. So the bevel radius was 0.09. And we'll increase the segments to two, just like last time. Now I'm going to want to control the size of our back programmatically. So let's expose the width, height, and depth as input pins. So we'll hit the eyeball on all three of these. And now because I want the back of the chair to always be the same width of the seat, I'm going to reference that same seat size variable that we made here. And then I'll plug this into the width. So let's do that. I'll take the seat size, plug it into the width, which is this first one here for me. And now let's create our own float node to determine how high we'd like the seat back to be. And this will end up being one of those parameters that we can change later on. So I'll hit spacebar float, and I'll connect this float to the height and it's going to freak out there for a second until we give it some information. I'll type in an arbitrary value like 10. And because we made a new float, I'm going to right click it and add a comment. And I'll just call this back height. 
Now, just like before, we need to place this cube on the ground plane. Let's do the same thing we did before by using a binary operation on float. So spacebar binary operation on float, change the operation to division. Let's get our back height, plug it into the value one, and then change the value to, to two. Now we're gonna have to transform or translate our primitive 3D. So let's create that transform node. What we're transforming is our primitive 3D. And now let's expose the translation. And I'll plug this in to make it a vector three with its automatic conversion from float to vector three and delete the X and the Z connections. That's the value one and value three here to just keep the Y. And now it's resting here and the pivot is now on the bottom in the center. That's exactly where we want it. Except now we want to position it above the seat and towards the back of the chair. So to do that, we have to know the thickness of our back cube so that we can know how far to move it back on our seat. I hope that made sense. So I'm gonna make a new float. Let's comment it and call it back thickness. And so really the thickness of our cube here is the depth parameter of our primitive 3D. So if I connect that to the depth and then give it a value. We can keep it to a value of one. And now we have what we had before. But now we can control how thick the back is if we wanted to. Now to better visualize what it is that we're doing, I'm going to get our merge node here. And I'm just going to merge this transform that we have connected to our back and just put it into the third input here and double click on the merge. So we can see what's going on here. Our back is in the center and we need to stack it on top of not just our legs, but also our seat height. So to move this up, we're gonna need another transform node for our back. So let's bring in a new transform. I'm gonna connect our previous transform to the source or the first input here on this new transform. And then I'm going to connect the output of this transform and replace our connection in the merge. That's the third one here, which is source two. So now if I single click on the transform and bring up the Y, we can see what we're doing in our 3D view with everything combined. With our new transform that we just made, I'm gonna make some room here. I'm gonna expose the translation parameter just like we've done before. I'm gonna use the eyeball this time to make a pin. And so I'm gonna use another binary operation on float to add together the height of the legs and the seat. So spacebar, binary operation on float. And luckily we have these variables and values already. So it's set to addition automatically. So let's take our leg height, plug it into the value one, or value two, either one works, because we're adding. And let me get the seat height, plug that into our new binary operation. So now if I plug this into the transform, you know it's gonna make that conversion node and make everything go a little bit crazy. I'll just delete the X and the Z. And we can see that it's resting now on top of our table. <laughs> So we've taken care of the Y, now let's take care of the Z axis. So we can do a little bit of experimenting here. If I plug the seat size float, take the seat size float and plug that into value three, which controls the Z axis. You can see it's moving it a bit too far. Let's divide that operation the seat size movement in half. So to keep things organized here, because we're gonna have a bunch of binary operations, I'm gonna comment this binary operation, the one that we've made so far. That's for the Y. We'll call it legs and seat height. And then I'll put Y here. 
it's really great to be able to add comments like that. And it sticks with the node when you do it that way. But now we need to make another binary operation and divide our seat size in half. So I'll just make another binary operation, set it to division. I know that we're going to be dividing by two. So value two is going to be set to two here, hard coded into the parameter. And what we are dividing is the seat size. So I'll grab another connection from the seat size and put it into the value one of our new operation on float. So now if I connect this to our float to vector in the Z, it's getting closer, but now you can see because our backs pivot is in the center of the bottom, we still need to move this in half of what this thickness is. So that's just one more binary operation on float to subtract the distance that we're moving this in the Z axis by half of this thickness. So to keep things organized here, this new binary operation that we did, I'm going to comment. This is half of seat size. And then I'll put Z. So I'll make a little more room, just move things down a little bit. And I'll make one more binary operation on float. Again, we're dividing by two. So value two is set to two again. And what we're dividing is the back thickness. So I'll take the back thickness float that we made. You can see why it's really useful to make those comments and then put it into the value one here. And so now we just need to subtract the result of this from half of the seat size. So one more binary operation on float, I'll set it to subtraction. And so now we're subtracting this, which is a comment and say half of back thickness. We're going to subtract this from this. So half seat size is going into value one, and then how much we're taking away is value two, which is half of the back thickness. Let's plug that into our Z, and there we go. Matches up perfectly. Okay, so we did a couple bits of operations here. Let me just add one more comment to this binary operation, which is subtract half back thickness from half seat size Z. Great. And let's frame up this component and call it back. And that's all three components of our chair. So what we could do is we could go and change our seat size and everything will adjust in position accordingly. And then I can change the leg height by clicking our leg height variable, make it a very short chair or a very tall high chair. And to make all of these adjustments easier, we can publish these parameters as graph parameters, just like we do for materials and textures. when we create a regular texture graph in Substance Designer. And so what we can publish are these float variables, which is why we have so many of them, and it makes it really easy to do so. So I'll start by selecting the seat size, and I'll right click and choose Exposed. And so what this does is it gives me a lot of similar information to what you'd get when you expose a parameter to a graph in a material. You have the identifier, you have the parameter itself, and then you have these ranges. And so you have soft and hard range. So soft range is what you'll be able to drag or change when you move the slider from left to right by default. But you know how in Substance Designer you can usually type in a parameter outside of that range and get a good result. Well, you can limit that by the hard range. What I'll do is I'm going to undo making that float exposed so that I can see kind of what the ranges are that I'm going to want. If I bring this value down, 
I, I don't think I'm going to want a chair smaller than eight. And then for a maximum, I, I think, uh, let's call it 15 as a maximum. So undo that. So now I know it's eight to 15. So if I right click and choose exposed, I'll do my soft range eight to 15. And I'm actually not going to want it to go any further than that ever. So I'm going to make my soft and hard ranges here in this tutorial the same. So minimum eight, maximum 15. And then I'll change the display name to seat size. Hit enter here. So now if I double click in the graph, you can see I have seat size and it'll go from eight to 15. I'll keep this at 12 for now. So let's do the same for the seat height. So right click on seat height here, exposed. And I know my range is probably going to be about one to three. So for my soft and hard range, I'll choose one, my maximum three. I'm just tabbing here to go through each parameter. One, tab, and three. And I'll change the display name to seat height. And now if we double click, there it is. Let's work on the legs a little bit here. So leg thickness, I wanna expose. Right click exposed. And I'm thinking a value of one to three is good here. So one, three, one and three. Call this. So right click expose the leg heights. And I know my range is gonna be about two as a minimum and 20 as the maximum. And I'll change the display name to leg height. Excellent. Last parameter I want to adjust is the back height. I'll expose that. And I think between five and 15 should work for us. So five and 15, I've worked out these values before just so we can get through this a little more quickly. And I'll change the display name to back height. Double click on the graph and now I can adjust the back height. Excellent. So now we have all of our parameters working as they should. That seat height one's funny. And change the seat size. Everything adjusts accordingly. So if I overview our graph a little bit, we started off with our seat and we created a primitive and we transformed it, putting it on the ground plane to shift where that pivot was. We did the same thing for our legs and we used that array duplication node, which lets us make multiple copies of our legs and also gives us that offset parameter, which keeps everything in place. And then we did the same thing with our back, we created a primitive and we did some quick math just to determine how far back we need to move the seat back so that it stays with this nice flat line here against the back and then merge them all together with a merge node. And you've got yourself a chair. Now to export this geometry, you can go to the scene menu in the 3D view and choose export scene and then choose export, which will give you the option to save it as an OBJ, PLY or FBX file. Wow. So we covered a lot of topics today. Let's review some of the important ones. First is how to position your objects so that they are sitting on the ground plane. I find myself getting the height of my geometry and then dividing it in half all the time. And with that knowledge, we can easily stack objects on top of one another or position them based on variables or exposed parameter values to place them in relation to one another regardless of any change in their size or position. Being able to expose those variables is so useful, and it's one of the reasons why procedural modeling is so powerful. Multiple objects can reference the same information, which is one of the things that saves you time in the long run. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and that it cleared up some of the questions you might have about procedural modeling. I've really enjoyed this process, so I'm looking forward to making even more procedural modeling content for Substance 3D Designer. Now, if you have any questions about this process or anything you'd like to know about model graphs or Substance Designer, please leave a comment down below. 
And if you like this video, it would be awesome if you can give it a thumbs up. It lets me know that you're watching and that you'd like to see more content like this. And if you do like these videos, hit subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when I post new ones. By the way, I just opened a Patreon page. So if you're interested in becoming a patron, looking for some cool procedural modeling or texture goodies, substance designer stuff, you can check out that link in the description down below. It's gonna be lots of fun. I'm Jeremy Siner. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.